I'll share my screen. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And today our speaker is Lucky. Um, uh, yeah, so and um, he will share with us like a, um, how to, um, you know, do a kind of like the development enterprise XR solution. So I will pass the baton to Lucky. Hi, Dominique. Hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here with you today. Excited to talk about enterprise XR applications, what we're building, and what the successes we've seen from doing that, and how, how we tactically approach building enterprise XR applications. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you see my screen? Oh, I think I think it's a whiteboard, right? Is that what you 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 are intend to? It's a white white space. No, I'm sharing Google Slides. Oh, you probably need to select uh, because on Zoom it has different windows. You probably need to select the first one. Is always whiteboard. I did select it. One second, let's try this again. Okay, share. Hmm. Do you see my screen now? It's just black. It says that you started screen sharing, but it's just black. I just stopped. I don't know why it's doing that. Let me try again. Maybe I'll just try opening it in Google rather than Chrome. Maybe that works. No. I am also using many, many screens. I don't know if that has a bearing on this. It says that you've started screen sharing, but again, it's just black. I am sharing my screen. I selected the window. Hmm. Is it black for you, Dominique? Oh, uh, I, I, I see the black blackout. Um, I'm choosing the specific window. Mm. Don't know why it's not behaving. Yeah. Um, are you using Mac? Or you use? Uh, I am using. I'm using. I'm using Mac. Oh, hey Mac. Mac supposed to be everything behavior should be right because PC sometimes it's a little weird because I use Mac, and this supposed to be the right one. I'm sharing basically a Google Slides presentation. How about you send the link to me and I will share my screen and you you, you tell me to. Absolutely yeah. happy to. <laughs> happy to hear. Let me just uh, yes. I'm put it in the chat for you, okay? Okay, okay. Copy link, go to chat. You should have it now. Okay, let me share the screen. Uh, can you see the screen? I can, you wanna go full screen for me? Yes, uh, give me a sec. Is this okay? Yeah, perfect. Cool, cool. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. I don't know why it's misbehaving. I have six monitors. It could be that's why. Um, okay, so CXR. Let's start with who we are and what we do and how we serve the ecosystem. We're a world-class XR agency. Uh, we have won a number of awards um, as an award-winning career technology lab, producing next-generation XR experiences 
for brands of every size. Size. We are best known for our work in augmented reality, virtual reality, machine learning, WebGL, and AI. Application development for the advertising and marketing, sales enablement, and enterprise training verticals. You want to move to the next slide, Dominique, for me? So CXR is part of a global family of companies. The parent company is Semtrex Inc. It's publicly traded on the NASDAQ. I sold my organization that I co-founded with my elder brother about six years ago to Semtrex. Semtrex is a global family of companies in the connective tissue that we build technology that changes the way we live, work, and play. Today, Semtrex is around 400 employees and six offices around the globe. Next slide, Dominique. CXR specifically is north of 150 people with the core thesis that we are hell bent on building and solving business and enterprise problems using emerging technology that is spatial oriented. We've won a bunch of awards along the way. Semtrex has been in the past 505 for the last 10 years. We've been nominated for Webby's, uh, among others. The ethos of our organization is, is a combination of disciplinary experts, whether it be technical architects, multidisciplinary design, mobile engineers, AR, VR engineers, front engineers, AI engineers, and we work in the agile scrum methodology. We are agnostic to vertical sector and technology. So we have teams that are focused on strategy, product, and support. So we're a full life cycle end-to-end -end lab that works with a number of enterprises following the Scrum Agile methodology. So moving on, some of our blue chip clients, you know, and this is just a taste of them. We've had the pleasure of working with Richemont and its Maisons, VF Corp and Vans, HBO Max, TD Bank, among others. And I'll show you a video next that shows you some of our work and some of the things that we've built at the enterprise scale and help businesses use to help solve different business challenges. So the first thing you see there is actually a multiverse for retail. It has a VR and AR application. This is a, an immersive meditation platform built for a medical institution. This is for bank to launch a new building in New York and a new facility using Atlas AR. These are sweepstakes campaigns we did for Constellation Bands to, to help at retail. This is another retail immersive experience. This is for facilities to test before they build. Um, these are for breweries to help see them. This is for Modelo and Constellation Brands again with sweepstakes and launching at retail. This is for a car company to, to have people see the product before it goes live. Enterprises who are looking to tour their properties and real estate that's looking to sell properties before they actually go live. This is for a luxury real estate organization that's looking to sell property in New York. Retailers of you know, furniture, HBO, immersive training, gamification for other organizations. So as you can see, us as an organization is not limited by one type of technology or one type of approach. We are ISVs of all the major headsets, whether it be Meta, Oculus, you know, Vive, HP, Pico, HoloLens, the Magic Leap. We also work with web AR platforms like Eighth Wall and Genie. Um, we are AWS APNs focused on the spatial computing vertical. So when we're looking at enterprise, we're agnostic. We look at the infrastructure that the enterprise already has. We design a team 
an assemble team focused on agile development. We, we help diagnose the problem. And then within their architecture and the technologies they're using, we build a strategy around the data architecture, the experiential architecture. We can do business consulting around the business. We research and audit the problem. Then we design the product and we go through UX, UI design, spatial design, the spatial audio design and the immersive environment, the 3D modeling where necessary. We also do ball cap and stereoscopic content capture. We do the stitching and editing. We do the 3D modeling. We do the development of the platform, whether it be Unity or on Rail um, or, or even beyond if it's web-based or something like that. Um, and then we develop it and we, we deploy it. Um, at, at times there's been, you know, enterprises have already built and prototyped. So we'll take their code, we'll optimize it for scale. We'll, we'll help them, you know, make it more mature and more you know, readily accessible. And then we'll support them. We'll train their organization. We'll, we'll, we'll launch the product, you know, and we'll go through future iterations, so, you know, through rinse and repeat cycles. And through our methodology, as you're working with enterprises, we front load foundational work. So sprints go smoother. We, we are adaptable, you know, through Scrum. So we're, we're launching product in, in increments of Scrum. So two week product launches. So, and we adapt to the business changes and the changing business requirements as we go through and we get feedback and iterate. So we ultimately arrive at a product to release and support that's stress-free at launch because it's been transparently developed in conjunction with them inside their architecture with frequent testing, giving the enterprise comfort when we're going to, to go live. So, you know, beyond who we are and, and the taste of what we do, and, and how, we, how we build it and the technologies we use, you know, and our blue chip clients, I think it's fun to show you some of the success we had. So the next video I'm gonna show you is actually of a product that we're launching in the coming weeks. And that product is for an enterprise that is focused on OSP and ISP materials. You know, they, they are a company that deploys fiber optics at scale. Um, they have earned their clients by understanding their needs and offering solutions, not only through their uh, products, but through their services. You know, they've redefined the client experience by three, three unique experiences, you know, customized solutions, local inventory, flexible financing. And, you know, they are a leader in, you know, fiber optics at scale for townships, municipalities, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I think we'll show you the video. It's an enterprise training scenario that we've built for them um, using the Oculus and the Oculus ecosystem to help them train employees in the field on how to service the product when, when different circumstances happen. So I have one training scenario that I've pulled out to show you of the product. And then from there, we can talk about some of the successes we've seen at enterprise by doing things like this in the enterprise training. So, uh, Is this the right slide? It is correct. Okay. So the, the, in this side, you see the technician is up on uh, a truck in, in the bucket and he is servicing the fiber optics. He's following step-by-step -step gamified process where he's able to clip the wires, remove the wires, you know, um, replace the wires and follow the steps to actually fix the broken fiber in the field. So fiber breaks because squirrels or other animals bite on it or storms or a number of different things. Now, a technician, and this is not the full experience, this is a splice of it. You know, the, the idea is that they go inside there, they're able to identify where the damage is. They're able to choose the right tools. They're able to actually service and replace the fiber and, and get it back up and running. And this is a very good use case of an enterprise behavior. 
and, and helping a Fortune 5000 think about how they can save a bundle of money uh, for, and move away from traditional training and build scalable spatial training to help their teams in the field actually diagnose and fix and prescribe solutions through a step-by-step -step gamified process to actually service in-field scenarios. Traditionally, they would have to have a technician, you know, be buddied with people that are in the field, learn how to do it, and then be able to, to do it, which is a much more cost intensive process for an organization when they could put people through to service these types of behaviors at scale. And when we met with this customer, just to give you more color as you're watching it, you know, they came to us of the, the, the problem that, okay, we have all this technology and all these use cases and we're having trouble getting people up to speed at an efficient rate to actually succeed at doing this and understand how to use the tools and you know, be able to successfully get positive outcomes. So they came to us with the questions like, how would you use XR to augment or improve our process and be able to achieve a higher standard of success and, and, and cost savings for us as an organization at scale. And we went through a process of understanding the organization, doing research and auditing, understanding the problem statement, understanding their current data architecture, and then designing the experiential architecture by consulting their business, and then designing a solution that helped them to put new employees, existing employees through ongoing training to be able to certify them and get them up to a pedigree that they can ensure that these technicians are in the field and able to achieve a higher success rate. In the case of this, this, this application, you know, we've done everything from designing all the immersive worlds, um, designing all the fiber and the feedback loops. So when you touch the fiber and the way it feels, the, the gamification, the, the level design, the, the scoring mechanism, the pass fail mechanism, all the spatial audio, which unfortunately you can't hear, um, you know, end to end. We've taken them through every last step of this, down to you know the enterprise deployment using a VR DM and to enable the distribution and the, the version control of these applications in, in the real world for them as they continue to push updates and iterate on them. So the reason I brought this up is because I think in terms of enterprise and spatial training, you know, we've seen a lot of different scenarios that, you know, make, make that are interesting, that, that, you know, we have partners that are intrigued by and, and using it. And, you know, we get a lot of questions, you know, around, around enterprise and training and whatnot. And, you know, that we see scenarios of, remotely training and onboarding new staff, safely training for hazardous work environments, training for undesirable and emergency scenarios, the ability to replicate hands-on equipment training, the ability to deliver continuous and soft skills training, the ability to capture and transfer institutional knowledge, right? And then it comes down to like the costs and challenges of adopting XR for training or, or for a business use case, the benefits of XR over traditional methods, uh, the resources required to, to deploy and deploy spatial applications at scale for enterprise. How does it, how does it scale? How does it help with on the job learning or recruitment or, or different things of that nature, right? And, you know, in the case of immersive training, you know, I think it's where I have some of the most data of what we've seen given what we've done. 
You know, we've seen 100% higher retention rates. We've seen extremely more confident trainees at 275%. We've seen 3x faster training times. We've seen the, the cost of training and onboarding go down substantially. We've seen a higher level of focus. And then we've also seen, you know, our, our participants be more emotionally connected to the content than in a classroom. And then they continue to ask for more of this. And then we've also seen an increase in success, a 15% increase in test scores, which ultimately results in more qualified people within the enterprise being able to achieve better results. So I'll pause there and you know, I'll open up to Q&A and, and be able to have a bigger conversation with you guys. You know, I can definitely go into other use cases of how we're doing it in retail and things of that nature. But I think given the data, I think you know, this is obviously very, um, very mature when we think about enterprise XR solutions and, and where we see Fortune 5000 spending dollars more than any, right? You know, we, we do lean into um, a lot of other XR applications for enterprise in, in different service vehicles like marketing, as you can see from that sizzle reel I threw in there. 3D modeling or you know, retail store virtualization and things of that nature. But more than ever, you know, I think that the catalyst to get these organizations to understand XR is traditionally helping them use things that help fix things within the existing business paradigm that start adding value to things they're already spending large sums of money on. And then they start thinking about how does these technologies then fit into other parts of the business workflow? Uh, Jean, do you wanna ask your Yeah, I, I thought that was very cool. Um, so I assume that uh, nobody is wearing the, the headset in the bucket in that, in that case. They're like looking at it offline before they drive to the site or maybe they're doing it in the van when they get there or something oh. like that. Oh, Gene, this is all in headset, right? So they have people sitting in at home or wherever they are, completely decentralized. They're in a right. headset. They get into the headset and they go into a home environment. They launch whichever of the experiences we built for training. Yeah. And, you know, they start the scene where they're, they're in, in the room. They get, you know, actually, you don't see this on camera. The phone rings. There's a, there's a service call, you know, and, and it's like, well, you know, there's this problem, you know, they understand it, they, they, they start going through the motions, and it's a gamified experience, right? So they take the steps, they get their tools, they get in the car, they drive to the site, they pull up on the site, they get out of the truck, they look around, they have to find where, where's the fiber broken in that case, then they, they, go, they walk, and this is all in VR with your controls, or you can do just walking around, and then, then they, you know, they get in the bucket, once they've diagnosed and saw where the fiber is broken, they get raised up, they get their tools, they actually cut and remove everything. Then they come down, they get into the back of the truck, you know, they start fixing the things and they go back up, they fix it, and they understand if they succeeded or not through the different motions. And then you're not, you may not get it right, but like, you know, the idea is that, you know, they're learning how to actually diagnose and, and service these types of workflows in spatial, right? But the, they're in headset the whole time. I hope that I hope that clarifies your question. But it's 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 like a game, right? Yeah. It's like the real world things and, and into a gamification and spatial computing to actually take real world scenarios that they're gonna experience and help them learn it through gamification and spatial before they ever put out in the field to have to really do this. Yeah. So it's from start to finish the whole experience. Um, I'm I'm just curious uh, for a company like this, might you additionally supply uh, an augmented reality system so that if they get out in the field, uh, it just uh, points out some things to them that that perhaps they might not remember or, or, or whatnot? Without a doubt. So, so you know, um, we've done a lot of AR work with the HoloLens as well, Jim. So, you know, I'll give you an example, right? There's a medical organization that works with injections and or injectables i should say we'll, we'll say that it's botox i won't specify the organization uh -huh. um so 
you know, we've built applications in our HoloLens that allow for a practitioner or a nurse or a medical a doctor or whatever you may have it to be able to use the HoloLens DK2 and map your face, identify 20 plus points of interest on the face, design a treatment plan and be able to execute on that treatment plan in real time and share the treatment plan with the patient. We've also done workloads for maintenance work was similar to this using a HoloLens. So one, one, and I can't say the name of the client as well, unfortunately, but it, you know, it's engine maintenance for airplanes. Uh -huh. So using a HoloLens rather than, you know, when you're servicing an airplane engine, right, you'd walk up and down a ladder. So you need to reference a textbook or there's one foreman to a dozens of people. Yeah. Okay. In this case, the, the employee actually looking to service that engine has a HoloLens on and they're going through a mixed reality engine repair and maintenance workflow. So uh -huh. it allows true interaction with 3D models integrated into the mechanics workflow, increasing safety and productivity. Right. So it, it maps the engine in real time. It gives you step-by-step -step instructions, provides socialized data to the organization. In this case, of this client, we have not done that because, you know, when we, when we look at it, you know, they're not mature in the way of spatial yet, right? They're learning about spatial and high benefits of their business. So the first step and the first problem we look at audit their business was, well, let's save you money on training. Let's build things that solve a problem that you are experiencing with learning and success rates of the field. Let's right. drive down the time for, you know, service workflow and drive down the cost. And hopefully we can do that by education, right? And ultimately the hope is, Jim, that we do get to a point where we can output people in the field with augmented tools to, to increase the success rate in the field should the training not be the end all be all. But you know, we usually look at things when we're looking at an enterprise, you know, and we do work with a lot of people in the Fortune 5000, but you'd be surprised that you know, people are dipping their toes into spatial computing today, even at the Fortune 5000. There are very few organizations as mature as like uh, a Boeing or, um, you know, a KLM or, you know, you know, some of these organizations that have been investing in spatial for over a decade or, or since the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, these other organizations, it, it's more of looking at a path of, what the business problems are on a matrix, looking at the, the challenges they're facing, and then trying to design solutions that are gonna solve the low hanging fruit and add real value before you start building the nice to haves. Right, right. That makes so sense. It, it's very interesting. It, so like for the engine repair, aircraft engine repair example, you're, you're sort of acting as a force multiplier for the foreman. Uh, so Correct, 100%. So you're saving a lot of money in that regard. For the uh, Botox example, you know, you see people on news, like newscasters and so forth that maybe have had a bad Botox job and are partially paralyzed on part of their face or something. So this would hopefully avoid that kind of outcome by showing exactly where you should be doing the injection for- Oh, like, for Botox. sure. And that's, yeah. a, that's a benefit. And like, you know, that, that, that's going through, you know, to do things like that, there's compliance and there's also um, some, some, you need some certifications to really get that at scale, right? You can't just like do that. So like, you know, they, they've been testing it and prototyping, we've been helping with them, but you know, basically the idea there was you did cutting edge, cutting edge facial tracking for modern medicine, where we developed an industry leading like face tracking technology with this AR toolkit that arms healthcare professionals with an unprecedented level of accuracy, right? right. And they're able to navigate procedures and consultations. So, you know, there's two states in that medical thing, right? There's one where it's, you have a cadaver and the guy's doing his learning, right? right? Before they actually get inside a patient. The next state is like, you know, you're mapping against their face. So say you're standing in front of you, Jim. I have yeah. it on. I'm able to stand in front of you and find all these things like, you know, against the cheekbone, against the jawline, against the lips, right? Like your LP2 or your LP4 and your C2 and your chin, whatever it is, right? And then I could see the code. I could see the different products that I want to use. 
and I can see the volume of, of what we're going to inject, and I can map this whole treatment plan against your face, and I can email you the treatment plan, or I can save the treatment plan, and I can act on the treatment plan. Right. Do you have to get FDA approval for something like that? You know, I, I don't handle the FDA approval side, but, you know, that, that I would, I would say that, yes, you know, right yeah. now it's in um, a, a, a state where it's being, you know, used in small audiences for, for testing. To ever get to a true FDA approval, you know, you need to go through clinical trials. Right. So I would say we're more at that stage. Whether they decide to go through it, I think they would. You know, they're a large, a very large organization. So it's sort um, of a gray area right now. Correct. I, I can think of one other application where this would be very useful, perhaps very lucrative. And that is my wife uh, works for medical school. And um, one of the, she's in the anesthesiology department. And one of the things they do is they have these like dummies. They're very expensive and very anatomically accurate and so forth. And they, the uh, residents, medical residents can train on the dummies to practice anesthesia. And they get like real time, you know, instrumentation and so forth of what's going on with that patient, so-called patient. And very expensive simulators, very expensive to set up and, and run and so forth. And I would think that something like what you're describing would shortcut a lot of that expense. For and sure. I don't know if the FDA approval process would be as stringent for something like that, because you don't really do a clinical trial for something like that, I wouldn't think. My, my wife also organizes clinical trials. I'm not 100% sure. You know, we are in, in, in talks to do other things in the medical space. Yeah. You know, um, you know, where we have never got to the education side of like a, a university side. You know, we were working with um, candidly and confidentially. Um, you know, I, so I can't release like the, the client or the exact use case, but it's a re it's a large rehabilitation center mm -hmm. that is you know working with people that are recovering from different kinds of strokes mm -hmm. and teaching them you know, things that they would need for success in the real world again, right? Oh. And then you have a stroke, you know, you've got to rebuild neural nets, right? So it's not yeah. a medical device, but ultimately it is, you know, something that would need certification because you are putting it on a patient in a recovery plan and whatnot. So it right. is, you know, a level of that. So they would have to go through clinical trials in that case. Um, and, you know, eventually they would seek FDA approval. Um, but, you know, I think in the education lens, you would still need that. You know, I think that there is, there is a lot of gray area, right? And like, it's, it's quite a, a lengthy process and you need a certain amount of data to be able to get to that FDA certification. Yeah, and you need a lot of expert staff to take you through that. Correct. Process. Well, I, I was just curious, what is the range of development times that you have from the start of the project where you evaluate the business to release of the, the whatever your product is going to be for that project? It really ranges. You know, a lot, of, a lot of times we'll suggest to an organization, let's start with a proof of concept or a minimal viable product, mm -hmm. right? You know, it, it's a lot easier for an organization to digest when they can see value and success as they're getting through it, especially if these larger organizations, you need stakeholders and champions within the organizations to buy into the, the vision and the value. Um, so, you know, when we're thinking about a smaller build, say we're talking about like a, a minimal viable product or proof of concept, you're looking at 10 to 14 weeks, mm -hmm. right? When you're looking at a greater build, you know, something that's going to be a, a commercial, commercial deployable product at scale, you know, it can go from, you know, once you get past and you have a prototype and MVP, an additional 16 weeks to something that could be six months, right? No. Or greater. Yeah. And it also depends what, what assets the, the organization has inside, right? Some organizations do have you know, stereoscopic AK content capture that they've used for other things, or they have 3D assets because of the business they're in that, that they already have, and you just need to fix the poly counts or, you know, do, do some work around optimization of the 3D models that will help you jump step, you know, and move forward. Others will have nothing. And then you're sitting there, you know, doing handheld ball cap of assets. You right. are modifying 3D assets and poly counts to, to get it to a more mature state where it's usable, right? Because 
you know, you can't have high poly assets going into VR and AR today, right? The computation power of like to say an Oculus Quest 2 is limited, right? It's a computer mm -hmm. on your head. While it's very impressive and you can do lots of great things, you can't get to these, you know, these million poly type assets in VR yet, right? It's gonna cause the machine or the computer to, to be slow and laggy and, and slip up. So you know, ultimately need you know, something that is you know, a, a balance of low poly and you know, great fidelity to actually get to something where we're, we're looking at something visually stimulating and, and appealing, right? Right. Yeah, uh, can I ask, like, uh, what's the price for that types of stuff? For example, like, I saw, like, the VR and uh, you cut that. Like, what's the scope of work? It seems like it will cost a lot, according to what you previous said, that for 10 to 14 for concept approval, 10 to 14 weeks for concept approval, and 16 to 6 months for scale, feels like it requires a team of um, you know, developers and business person, designers, and jumping to the enterprise and work with them for probably a year to come up with that stuff. And as far it as I know- It does get to that level sometime, for sure. Yeah, Again, you can build up that. If it's successful, they can, it can go on for some time and you can continue to build on it. Yeah. Um, you know, we, as I mentioned, we work in Agile, right? So the, we're selling time boxed increments oh, of our time. Sweet. We assemble teams. And we, and we sell sprints, oh, candidly, sprints. right? And, and a sprint could be, you know, eight to ten thousand dollars. It could be north of that, right? Mm -hmm. So depending on what we're building, the team assembled, the price will vary, right? So you know, we we've seen things that are in the five figure range for a, a proof of concept MVP. Mm -hmm. We've seen full builds that are in the six to seven figure range. It, mm -hmm. it really varies, right? There, there's no mm -hmm. one fits all here. Um, there, there is a mix of, of, and also depends on what the organization has, what the internal resource pool is that we're working with, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would say at, at minimum, you're looking at five figures and maximum it gets into seven figures. Yeah, um, yeah, because as far as I know, if you want to create, like back in 2018, if you want to create an AR app application, AR for marketing, it's around 40K per, per app. 40K, I don't know. It's kind of no, something yeah, that I hear. If you're looking at like a simple marketing thing where it's a web AR appless yeah. experience, where it's a QR code, la launch thing via QR code, use a platform like 8th Wall. Um, mm, and I do yeah, love the 8th Wall. wall yeah, 8th Wall was bought by uh, Lightship. Niantic. Or, yeah, Niantic. Yeah. Niantic. Niantic owns Lightship as well. Yes. Um, so, you know, and actually, this week they integrated Lightship into Eighth Wall, so you can do some really cool stuff uh, to, to plug yes. them. I mean, we do work with them a lot. Um, you know, so it can be it can be like forty k, right? If you're doing something like you know what I showed the constellation brands there, where mm. you scan a QR code and you have like uh, an at retail activation mm. on POP that's tied mm. to a sweepstakes and a gamified experience. Yeah. You know, you're going to look at something like. 30 to 50K. If we're looking at something that's more complex, like what we're talking about, these spatial VR, AR applications where you're using a HUD, a heads up display device, yeah. then yeah, you're going to get north of that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, uh, when I see the really good solutions of training, I like everything in, in my mind is that, wow, you guys need to talk to the business person and figure out what's the problem. And the designer and developer need to understand how to start creating this. And people, user testing need to jump in. And I was like, wow, even though you just show me like a one minute or, you know, some simple gamification stuff and the, you know, the, the art looks like, I don't want to say triple A, but somewhat it's pretty decent. So just think of like the entire scope of work. I feel like it's at least six months to one year of a team dedicated to just, you know, gamification. I know when you talk, it's just like, oh, it's gamification, da, 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 training. But I know the, back, uh, you know, like backstage, I know it's a lot of work. Oh, yeah, it is a lot of work. <laughs> It's, it's worth it though. It's super interesting to be able to do it. And uh, I feel very lucky and fortunate to be sitting in this position in the ecosystem, right? Mm, yeah. But yeah, 
you know, and yeah, to be able to achieve that, it looks, it, the end result looks simple at times, but yeah. you know, it's really not simple to be able yeah, to Yeah, when that, I see right? that simple solution, I was like, wow, because make it complicated, it's easy. Make it sure. really complicated, like, you know, you have a wearable, like pen UI or environment UI, but make it so intuitive without uh, a lot of onboarding, it's hard. <laughs> Make people just, to, like, yeah. You, you got, and you're using it people that are not like necessarily technically savvy, right? Yeah. They're savvy at what they're doing that and where they are, right? A lot of times, mm. these people are not actually like, they're not at home playing in VR the way you or I might be, right? Already, they may not even own a VR headset. I've never even been in VR or space yeah. travel before, right? And I admire the, the simplicity. Time. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to make it something that they can easily digest, easily. Something that really adds value, right? Yeah. And it, it's very easy to, to build things that are clunky and, you know, you, you, it, it's much harder to build things that are simple and intuitive. It's very hard to, simplicity is very hard and, to achieve. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you, like, do you use like a, a frequent user testing event. How can you get something so simple, so innovative um, in the scope of work? Are you guys trying to, I, I don't know, like there are two ways of design, right? One is everyone locked in a, in a little room and after six months come up a brilliant idea, right? Another one is you, you test things out. Like every week you have uh, some, something very similar to game development. You have some little uh, mark and you have people to join you and start uh, testing and give you feedback. What types of like development mass, like like you find like uh, the world brilliant people in the little room and everyone discuss, present to the high level it's person? A, it's, or... it's a mix here, right? So mm -hmm. we're building in, in Agile, as I mentioned, right? So every mm -hmm. two weeks there are actual tangible deliverables right mm. and we're always testing as we're doing it throughout the organization we have functional testers on staff and whatnot so mm. we as an organization are always play testing and testing but mm. then at the same time where should our enterprise partners are you know involved all the way through so every two weeks we're passing them mm. practical whether it be designs or software or whatnot for them to use, right? Yeah. The other thing to share is that like, when we're looking at a process, right? And we're building it, you know, we're not just like, we don't design 3D and 2D, right? Like, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, like we're, we're building, you know, our software and, and designing our software for 3D mm -hmm. natively, right? So mm -hmm. as we're going through it, we're, we're building, you know the designs in a 3d first way so that we use tools like shapes mm -hmm. xr maybe or mm -hmm. whatnot right and mm -hmm. so we have tools that help us do that so ultimately as we're getting through it right mm -hmm. we'll go through say we're getting a big issue we'll do six brainstorming whiteboarding sessions up there up front with the enterprise client we'll go through mood boards right and mm -hmm. whiteboarding then we'll do preliminary concept art and sketches then mm -hmm. we'll build you know prototypes around that right mm -hmm. And we'll create user interactions documents that outline user behavior definition, capabilities definition. Then we'll get to high fidelity 3D concept art. So we're actually starting to see the 3D world before we ever build it. We see that you could be in there, right? Oh. Um, and even when we're prototyping, we'll, we'll use tools like ShapesXR or we'll use Multibrush or other things like that to, oh. to be able to see and play with it and be in there and prototype before we're laying code down. So we actually wow. start getting a feel for things and interactions, right? Mm. And then we'll get into like UX wireframe design and site map and user journey. Oh, so you do the technical architecture and all wow. that. But we're mm. high fidelity 3D concept art and seeing that and playing with that before we're actually coding and building it. And then we start building and playing it in two-week increments. And, and when we're testing, we're, we're not the only one testing. We have our partners, our customers, you know, yeah, they're testing right. with their organization, with experts who are actually doing this in yeah. the real, and we're getting mm -hmm. real practical feedback and we're, we're optimizing. We're not like, you know, the reason we work in Agile and Scrum is because, you know, we're not trying to marry some scope and be like, you know, six months later, be like, surprise. Yeah, right, right, right. That, 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 that's really scary of, you know, Everyone just 
expert, so-called expert, and close the door, and we just discuss for like a one year and come up with something that everyone's shocked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we want we want continuous feedback loops, and we want continuous iteration, right? And we mm -hmm. want to use optimization on the process. So, you know, if there, things are great in theory, you start playing with it. You start to learn things about the interaction, the function, the behavior, how it's actually mm -hmm. going to work in the real world. And you need to ingrain those feedback loops into the actual build and product. So you got to continue to be iterating on requirements to actually get in a final product that's scalable or practical, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not like, it's not like, like, this is the scope, this is what we're building, this is what you get. It's like, well, this is theory, what we're going to build. This mm -hmm. is our process. Let's yeah. start iterating incrementally to get there. Let's diagnose and prescribe as we're going through the process. Let's shape shift and evolve the requirements to actually meet the outcome we want. Mm -hmm. And what we're, when we're practically testing, we're learning and we're implementing to evolve the product backlog to actually get yeah, it's very similar to game development, like a level design, gray box design. And uh, as far as I know that some successful games, developer will have a PSR 9 every week, it, which allows their user tester just came and eat pizza and just play some gray box. And every week they will just like write down all the feedback and start re-implement in. So yeah, I think those stuff, I, I can definitely tell that what you guys are doing is definitely what the um, your client needs and your, the customer needs. So I, 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 I think this well, yeah, the, the, the entire collaboration, the, the process must be really efficient and smart. Yeah. For sure. It, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of learning from game design, for sure. And we do have a, a team within Semtrex that's focused on game design. It's called Bravo Strong. So we do have a sister company that is just a game design studio wow. as well. Um, yeah. So we do get into the mix of that stuff and those behaviors as well. But um, yeah, it definitely, definitely shares a lot of uh, familiar processes and behaviors from, from, from game design. Yeah, right, right. Cool. Uh, Jim, do you want to ask another question or that's a legacy hand? Yeah, I was uh, curious, where do you think all this is going five years from now? And what capability would you most like to have that you don't have right now? Where do I think this is going? You know, I always uh, say that, that the, the spatial revolution in a very real way, is more akin to the computer revolution than the mobile revolution, right? So everybody's been like, oh, this is the year of spatial or VR, right? I, I think that's a, a hard statement to make, right? And I think that's an unnecessary statement to make. Right? It's like, there's no carrier subsidizing the user end adoption or the enterprise adoption of devices. I think we're, we're on more of a 20 year curve, like sort of how, you know, the, the PC land up in people's houses, right? Because once in my time, when you, you you'd hear people be like, I don't need a computer in my house. I'll go to the library. And then the laptop came on. It's like, why would I carry a computer around with me? This doesn't make sense. And now yeah. you see uh, the people have six monitors and multiple PCs in the house and laptops, right? I think, you know, we're going to continue to see the adoption curve go up for spatial devices, right? We're going to see more and more people have them in the houses or you're going to see a wider audience, right? People, people are, are unaware most times that, that like Oculus, it's out selling Xbox and PlayStations at this point, right? Mm -hmm. You're selling, you're getting more Xboxes, you're getting less Xboxes and PSs to evolve and adopt into the end consumer's house, right? So, you know, I think that we're going to continue to see you know, spatial devices penetrate our everyday lives, right? And we're going to see them become more ingrained in our businesses and our personal lives. Right, so I think that's what we're naturally gonna see. We're also gonna see um, greater penetration because of costs gonna become more efficient and, and processing power of devices gonna become more efficient, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and then we're also gonna see aha moments, right? Like you're gonna see the new, the new meta device coming out, right? Like, uh, or they call codename Project Cambria, right? It's gonna be a much different device than what we're talking today. You're gonna see Apple release a spatial OS and we're gonna see that happen. Right, and we're going to see some of those things become more real. We're also going to see that, you know, with the the growth of high speed internet, the ability to have more 
real time interactions in the real world are going right. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, we haven't seen the aha moment from AR, same like VR yet, right? Like, if you think you're walking around with magically upon you, that little little backpack like a CD player, most people are not going to, right? Um, you know, just so like, you'll get to a point where they're in your glasses or your contact lenses or right. whatnot, and they're going to become more part of your work to your day-to-day -day workflows, right? So I do think that we're going to see a higher level of commercialization and consumer and enterprise adoption, right? And we're starting to see it, but we're going to see a slow hockey stick growth, right? And as that happens, you're going to see it more ingrained in our workflows or whatnot. So, so like somebody like me, and I'm very in deep in space, I take tons of meetings in Horizon Workrooms. In fact, I love it. The sense of presence, being able to high five somebody in a room and actually have a meeting, unbelievable, right? It's much better than being in 2D. I love being on Zoom with you guys. If we could have done this in spatial, I think we would have had more fun, right? And you're gonna see more full body and whatnot. It's just it just it just bridges the gap, right? And you start to see that like the human mind can connect the dots and it's only gonna get better as graphics get better, right? Today, we, you know, as spatial developers, we use paradigms of magic, change blindness, or all these different things to bridge the gap of the human mind. The human mind connect, is able to connect those dots, right? You're going to see more integration of haptics and all these different things that, that start to make this, the sensory experience of the human body, you know, and interactions become more and more realistic for you. Now, do I think we're going to land up in snow crash or one of these theories that we see? I hope not, right? I hope it's a better metaverse than those. And I hope it's a better multiverse than those things and a better connected experience, right? I, I, I hope that we don't build a generation of zombies, right? I hope that we're responsible to the technology we build and we build it for a value of society and things of that nature, right? Now, not everybody's going to think of that. There's always people that have to gain. But what my, my hope is that, right? And I do see society moving that way at a hockey stick growth right as things become more accessible and and what is the one capability that you'd most like to have that you don't have right now uh, what, what do i want that i don't have yeah um uh, you know i don't know if it's something that i personally don't have because i think you know everything is an organic growth curve i think the one thing that i do want and hope for is larger audience spaces because all of a sudden it makes the usage of the device and the experience much more accessible like you still see people you know leaning in towards mobile or web or whatnot because it's like well i have a larger audience there like yeah. you know you're going to get a larger more engaged audience when you put them in spatial to be honest with you right uh -huh. but we need we need penetration of hardware and you know ecosystem economics of like you know um bandwidth and your connectivity and all these things to come together you know there'll be a, an influx point where that happens now that's what i'm hoping for right you know i'm hoping for a larger adoption base to actually get there if we look at where technology is of like what unity can do and unreal can do and like whatnot i think we're growing at a nice rate right i don't yes. think we could ask more from the hardware ecosystem or the software ecosystem I think, I think, you know, that's going to take its organic growth, right? I remember as a kid convincing my dad to give me one of those older IBM laptops and, and running DOS commands, right? Uh -huh. and, and like, you know, and then like, obviously we got to like, you know, where we are today, right? And the web, web 1.0, and then we got 2.0, social login. Now we're getting, you know, web 3.0, where, you know, it's a different sense of ownership and, you know, blockchain and all these I think we're on 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 a smart trajectory. It's going to continue to grow in the right way. I think it's it's a matter of like spatial adoption is what I want, right? And I think that's coming. Yeah, excellent answer. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? I I guess I'm one thing I'm wondering is, uh, do you see a role for stereoscopic three D? I do. I do see a robust stereoscopic 3D. Um, you know, we do shoot stereoscopic AK content. We've done that and used it before and integrated it into what we're doing. Um, you know, I think there's there's things that 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 3D modeling can't can't provide. Like you know, yeah. there's oh, uh, for example, and and I, I I'll take you to the next scenario, right? There was a large uh, conglomerate that owns a lot of retailers, and they came to us and they wanted to build training. 
for a dangerous situation. Let's use one of the scenarios, armed robbery at a retail location. If I did that without stereoscopic 8K content capture and using that stereoscopic in VR, I would never bridge the gap mentally, right? Uh-huh. But now all of a sudden when you're in the step of a retailer, you're, you're doing sales and you're sitting there and you get the stores being cased, robber comes in, holds you up at gunpoint, it's hard. It's hard not to realize that you're not being held up at gunpoint. <laughs> you're you're in VR, right? And there are things that are undeniably better when you're using stereoscopic content capture and AK when it's done well to actually create these immersive experiences. So I do see a real space for it, right? It's inevitably needed. Uh, I think how, how these blur blurring subjective. I think um, you know there are additional skills to display things uh, in a stereoscopic way. Uh, there's certain rules that you have to be careful not to violate and so forth. Otherwise, you've got your user throwing up. Uh, oh, for sure, motion sickness is a real thing, right? Frame rate, frame rate matters. Yeah. Right? yeah. Plus, I, there there are limitations to the current headsets and so forth that uh, make it make stereoscopic display less inviting. It can be improved over time, but um, to me, it's it's important because when you see something in stereo, you immediately perceive all the depth. And whereas if it's not in stereo, you rely on other cues like moving your head around or whatever to try to perceive the depth. That's why in movies they do a lot of motion of the camera and so forth because it provides well, sure. stereo from motion cues. Uh, and so um, I, that's why I'm a 3D photographer. That's why I, you know, I love just having both eyes presented with a, a real stereo view. I concur. I think, I think it's, a, it's something that will continue to evolve with the ecosystem and the hardware that's accessible to it. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Any other questions? Cool, I think it's that's end here. And thank you so much for Lucky for your time and give us such a wonderful and insightful uh, event. Thank you so much. And hopeful, uh, hopefully see you soon. Mm. Great. Thank pleasure. you for having me. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.